Before we begin today's episode, just a reminder to like, subscribe, and turn on the notification bell if you enjoy this episode. It was a cold and rainy morning on November 22, 1985. As a neighbor made her way to work, she noted a strange scene. A young boy standing in the rain without shoes or socks, playing with a dog by his mailbox. Just over an hour later, that same child would be reported missing. Despite exhaustive searches and multiple departments and federal agencies contributing, the disappearance of Jeremy Grice was a mystery which fought hard against being solved. Police were limited in evidence and tips, some pointing towards the family, others towards an unknown man seen in the company of a similar child that same day. Many years after Jeremy's disappearance, police began to consider a possible connection to a convicted killer who had targeted children in Jeremy's age range within close proximity to where he was last seen. For some, though, the idea of a stranger abduction seems too bizarre and they believe someone closer to home knows exactly what happened to four-year-old Jeremy Grice. This is Trace Evidence, Episode 120, The Disappearance of Jeremy Grice. Welcome to Trace Evidence. I'm your host, Stephen Pacheco. Today we examine the mysterious disappearance of Jeremy Grice. Before getting into the case, just a few notes about the show. Trace Evidence is a weekly true crime podcast focused on unsolved murders and disappearances. You can follow the show on social media on Twitter at TraceEvPod, Instagram at TraceEvidencePod, or by searching Facebook for Trace Evidence. The show is also available on MeWe and Minds. If you're interested in supporting the show and getting some Trace Evidence merch, there's a Patreon available at patreon.com slash traceevidence, or you can donate via PayPal. Visit trace-evidence.com for all social media links, donation options, and contact information. You can submit case suggestions directly through the website or email me at traceevidencepod at gmail.com. Four-year-old Jeremy Grice was last seen standing outside of his home in the cold rain. 35 years later, and the mystery of what became of him still remains. This is episode 120, The Disappearance of Jeremy Grice. Hurricane Kate had swelled up and stormed into the Gulf of Mexico in mid-November, the last in a busy season which had seen six hurricanes already. Kate was a fierce hurricane, holding the record for being the latest annual storm to strike the mainland with hurricane intensity, most storms not being able to hold up that strength so late in the year. The hurricane marched up the length of Florida, making contact in the Keys before being the first hurricane in nearly a decade to reach the panhandle. While Florida took the brunt, Alabama and Georgia were both hammered by strong winds and heavy rains, with the latter experiencing flash floods and 80-mile-per-hour winds. There were even some storms and wind gusts surpassing 50 miles per hour as far north as Charleston. Hurricane Kate officially dissipated on November 25th, although it had been losing strength for several days. On November 22nd, while the hurricane was beginning to slow down, Winds and rain stretched across the Georgia border, bringing in unseasonable chills and cold rains in several locations along the South Carolina-Georgia border. Bath is an unincorporated community in Aiken County, located in one of the more rural quadrants of the Horse Creek Valley. While Bath is part of Aiken County, it's actually considered to be a piece of North Augusta, the metropolitan area located just 10 miles to the northeast of the city center, across the South Carolina border. On the morning of Friday, November 22, 1985, remnants of the storm could still be felt as the area of Bath experienced temperatures in the low 50s with cold rain, four inches of accumulation. Geneva Van Buren was getting ready to head to work at a beauty shop, which she owned. Every day, Geneva would arrive to work at 9 a.m. to open up for business, and this day was no different. 
However, as the woman drove northwest along Dick's Drive towards the main road, she passed Miller Street and noticed something which struck her as odd. At approximately 8.45 a.m., Geneva saw a young boy standing outside with no shoes on playing with his dog near his mailbox. For Geneva, it was odd primarily because of the weather, cold and rainy. Why would a young child be there playing without shoes? While Geneva did not know the boy's name, she recognized him as one of the local neighborhood children. Geneva continued on her way and would ultimately become the last confirmed person to see four-year-old Jeremy James Grice alive. Approximately an hour and 15 minutes later, Jeremy's mother, Donna Arrington, woke up to start her day. At the time, Jeremy was living with his mother and stepfather, Nikki Arrington, in a mobile home at 206 Miller Street, approximately a quarter mile northwest of Geneva Van Buren's home on Mullins. Jeremy's biological father, Ray Grice, was also local to the area, though he didn't live in that Bath neighborhood. At the time, Donna worked night shifts while Nick worked in the morning, which meant Donna would often put Jeremy on the school bus and then not see him again until she awoke the next morning. Jeremy was attending pre-kindergarten classes at nearby Jefferson Elementary, though at the time of his disappearance, classes were canceled for the upcoming holiday. Nick would come home in the afternoon, take care of Jeremy, feed him dinner, and see him off to bed. On this morning, though, Donna couldn't find her four-year-old son. According to official reports, when Donna arrived home in the early morning hours of the 22nd, she passed by her son's bedroom and glanced inside. While she can't say she actually saw Jeremy, she noted that his blankets were pulled up and she could make out his shape beneath them. Hours later, when she awoke, she found Jeremy's bed empty and she wasn't able to locate him inside the home. After going through the home several times, calling his name and searching, she proceeded outside and began calling out for Jeremy, though she received no answers. Panicked and unsure of where her son could be, Donna began making calls to friends and neighbors. At first, she assumed someone must have picked him up. He's been described as an extremely friendly young boy who loved going for rides. In a discussion with reporters, Jeremy's uncle, David Smith, the police chief of nearby Burnett Town, explained how he would often take Jeremy along with him on errands, saying, quote, I used to call him my little road buddy because anywhere I went, he would go. He would say, okay, I'm game for it, end quote. Donna placed a call to Jeremy's father, Ray, to ask whether or not he had come and picked up his son. But according to Ray, he hadn't been by the home. He believed Jeremy had likely gone off with a relative or a friend and would return, but this didn't really ease his own panic that was beginning to build. After making her calls, Donna came to the frightening realization that no one had seen her son that morning and surely no one she knew had come to pick him up. According to Donna, it was highly unusual for Jeremy to be missing from the home, not just because a four-year-old doesn't typically travel on his own, but because Jeremy was afraid to go off and do new things on his own. He always wanted someone along with him, and he was afraid people would leave him behind. Countless mornings had begun similarly, and while Donna never thought Jeremy would leave the house, she had on more than one occasion made him promise that he would never go out that door without her. Something was very off in her opinion, as Donna later told reporters, there were animal crackers and lollipops easily accessible on the kitchen table, and there's no way Jeremy wouldn't have gotten into them. Seeing the untouched treats sitting out was enough to give her a larger swell of concern. However, what she found next would completely tip the scales. Lying beside Jeremy's bed were his socks and shoes and his favorite jacket, gifted to him by his father. A jacket Jeremy wouldn't go anywhere without. His mother had a hard enough time convincing him not to wear the jacket in the summer, but given the weather, there was no way he would have gone outside without it. Donna later told the Greenville News, quote, He never leaves the house without the jacket his daddy bought him at the racetrack, end quote. Beyond that, according to Donna, Jeremy was afraid of the rain, with her telling reporters, quote, it was raining when he disappeared, and Jeremy was scared to death of rain. He didn't leave this trailer. Somebody came in here and got him. End quote. Jeremy James Grice was born on May 12, 1981, and has been described as a very polite, sweet, and loving little boy who was very social. 
He was an extremely intelligent boy, with his mother noting that while he did not have any hearing issues, she had taught him several expressions in sign language. In fact, when Donna last saw her son putting him on the bus for school, their last exchange was to sign I love you to one another. Jeremy apparently had a humorously serious demeanor for a four-year-old, with Donna telling the Greenville News, quote, I always called him my little man because he was always so serious, end quote. According to articles of the time, Jeremy enjoyed going to school, and it was later theorized that he may have been outside that morning waiting for the bus, unaware that there weren't classes that day. The following is a short clip of Jeremy's uncle, Chief David Smith, describing the four-year-old to WJBF News Channel 6. He was just full of energy. He uh, unfortunately never met a stranger. Much like you'd imagine, a lot of descriptions go into detail about how Jeremy loved riding his big wheel and playing with the family dog, a German shepherd, not much out of the ordinary for a four-year-old. Jeremy's parents, Donna and Ray, had split up several years prior, during which time Donna had met and married Nick. According to all reports, there were no signs of discord between the family members, and while Ray and Donna were no longer married, their separation didn't appear to be an acrimonious one. By all accounts, Jeremy was adored by his family and was close with them, seeing his father during arranged visits according to the divorce settlement and spending time with his uncle and others. On the morning of the 22nd, after discovering her son missing and making multiple calls, Donna finally called the Aiken County Sheriff's Office and reported him missing. According to official case documents granted to trace evidence by the Aiken County Sheriff's Office, the first officers arrived on the scene at approximately 1 p.m. Despite a thorough search, I've been unable to locate any information which explains the gap in time between Donna noting Jeremy is missing at approximately 10 a.m. and police being notified nearly three hours later, though there does appear to be some mention that friends and family had been searching for the boy and perhaps the call was made only when those searches were exhausted. Some of the first officers responding were Lieutenant Becky Edmonds and her partner, Daisy Stallings. Edmonds had been dispatched by her then-supervisor, Captain Whitehurst, to respond to the missing child report. Edmonds later told reporters that upon arrival, Donna appeared frantic and explained that she had discovered her son was missing after she woke up that morning. According to case files, deputies upon arriving at the scene double-checked the home and surrounding areas, speaking with neighbors and relatives, though there didn't seem to be a trace of Jeremy. By 1.48 p.m., deputies had informed Captain McCormick of the situation, and he arrived on the scene to get a sense of what was going on. When it became clear that the child was missing and no one had seen him, McCormick contacted Aiken County Sheriff Carol Gettings Heath, who then called in all off-duty personnel to assist with a search. Around the same time that Sheriff Heath was gathering up Sheriff's Office personnel to assist, Captain Whitehurst redirected all available investigators to the location, as well as heading over to the home himself. In addition to off-duty personnel, the Sheriff's Office also called in all reserve deputies. Contact was made with surrounding areas, and the search team was joined by members of local fire departments and divers from the Aiken Department of Public Safety, as there were several ponds nearby to the Arrington home. While the search itself was being organized, deputies questioned both Donna and Nick, hoping to gain further information about friends, relatives, and neighbors, anyone who Jeremy could possibly have gone with. During this time, police were able to establish a partial timeline of events from that morning. According to Nick, he had left home to go to work at approximately 7 a.m. When he left, Donna was asleep, but Jeremy was awake and playing in the house. This narrows down the window on Jeremy's disappearance to have been sometime between 7 a.m. and 10 a.m. Despite this, officers were unable to gather any information which they felt could further assist in the investigation. Around this time, Jeremy's father Ray arrived on the scene to participate in the search. While Ray was questioned by authorities, there didn't appear to be anything at the time which could indicate his involvement and reports note that Ray appeared to be upset and concerned for the well-being of his missing son. In total, the search team was comprised of approximately 125 individuals, law enforcement, volunteers, neighbors, and family. The Arrington home was located in an area near dense woods and several ponds, 
and so the searchers were somewhat challenged being out in the rugged terrain. Sheriff Heath later told the Index Journal, quote, There's a lot of wooded area to be covered. We swept probably a three or four mile radius of the dwelling. We covered it on foot, and in some areas we had horses out. End quote. Despite the range of the search, no traces of Jeremy were located. As the search continued, the sunlight began fading, and the sheriff's office called in further assistance from the South Carolina Law Enforcement Division, or SLED, who had access to a helicopter for an air search. SLED agent Paul Grant arrived on the scene and granted the helicopter search, which was conducted over the course of approximately two hours. In addition to the main search, deputies continued to question neighbors as they arrived home for their evenings, searching for any information about Jeremy anything odd they'd seen that day, any strange individuals or vehicles lurking in the area. At approximately 2 a.m., Sheriff Heath called back all law enforcement and a meeting was held to review all data and information related to the case. For the first night, the search was called off and scheduled to begin again the next day, Saturday, November 23rd, at 6 a.m. By Saturday morning, in addition to all previously mentioned volunteers and agencies, the FBI became involved. Sheriff Heath assigned search locations to different team members as well as delivering all information about Jeremy's disappearance to local television, radio, and news media to get the word out. All tips were directed to be phoned into the sheriff's office, at which point they would be relayed to investigators to follow up. A supplemental report provided by the sheriff's office explains that multiple tips were called in that morning and all tips were thoroughly investigated, though they yielded no results. It was this morning, though, when investigators Ray, Huff, and Hicks worked alongside sled agents and FBI agents in conducting another canvas of the area, questioning neighbors. This is when they came upon Geneva Van Buren. Now, there's some confusion about the exact geography of how the sighting worked. According to all official documents, Jeremy's home is addressed at 206 Miller Street. However, this location no longer exists. There's a new development, and according to multiple news reports, the location of Jeremy's former home is gone now. That mailbox has been replaced by a large sign which just reads, Road Ends. However, Miller Street comes to a dead end there after taking a sharp curve, making it impossible to see from Dick's Road, which is approximately a tenth of a mile north. Maybe, though, in 1985, the layout was vastly different, and Van Buren would have been able to see Jeremy's mailbox from the main intersection, but at the current time, it would have been an impossibility. This has raised some questions as to whether it was possible Van Buren had actually seen Jeremy at someone else's mailbox perhaps closer to that main road. According to official reports, Van Buren noted seeing the young boy standing at the mailbox accompanied by his German shepherd. Van Buren described Jeremy accurately and listed his clothing as being blue jeans, no shoes, and either a purple or dark blue sweater or shirt. It's interesting to note that, at the time of Jeremy's disappearance, the dog was also missing. While investigators were taking a statement from Van Buren, members of the search team were in the process of draining two ponds located nearby. Official reports note that the draining of at least one pond continued into the early morning hours, finishing at approximately 3 a.m., but nothing was found. In addition to the second day of foot searches, the sled helicopter flew over for approximately three hours but also failed to locate anything connected to Jeremy. Agents from the FBI put a tap on the Arrington's phone in case there might have been a ransom demand coming in, and a mobile command post was set up to relay all information and coordinate with searchers and local police. Flyers were printed up by SLED planned for distribution the following day, Sunday the 24th, at which time investigators would once again begin the process of canvassing the neighborhood for anyone who might have seen something. The canvas began at approximately 8 in the morning, and is described in supplemental reports as interviewing relatives, babysitters, family, and neighbors. The document also notes that on that particular Sunday, 85 missing persons flyers were distributed to local businesses by uniformed officers. Investigators also set up a roadblock nearby and questioned all drivers coming in and going out of the subdivision between 7 and 9 a.m. 
Questions included place of work, where they lived, and where they were or what they saw on the morning of November 22nd. Through re-canvassing and roadblocks, police were given two potential clues about an unfamiliar vehicle in the area. One was noted as being a brown van and the other a two-tone blue van. Investigators managed to track down the owner of the brown van as belonging to a local. The blue van belonged to a family registered in Florida, though the owner was tracked down and it was discovered that he was working construction in the Aiken area. While authorities received multiple tips about the vans, they were searched by investigators, but no clues or evidence were discovered. Following up on the owner's alibis, both men and their vehicles were cleared of involvement. On Monday, the 25th, the primary focus of the searches revolved around two ponds located within a half mile of the Arrington home. More than 60 law enforcement officers were involved in their draining and search, though nothing was found to indicate Jeremy had been there. Both Jeremy's mother and stepfather assured police that Jeremy wouldn't have gone near a pond as he had a fear of water. While no signs of Jeremy could be located after days of searching, the family dog wandered back to the home that morning. While investigators had already been considering that they might be dealing with an abduction rather than a child who wandered off, the return of the dog fanned those flames further, with investigators noting that friends and family all along had said that the dog didn't leave Jeremy's side. Sled spokesman Hugh Munn told reporters, quote, From what we're told, wherever the kid went, the dog went, which is another fear that it might be foul play. End quote. When asked about the search, Sheriff Heath was forthright in that they looked everywhere and couldn't find anything telling the Times and Democrat newspaper, quote, he's just not there, end quote. When asked about why they had not employed bloodhounds, Sheriff Heath explained that family and neighbors had searched the area before authorities had been notified, and that in doing so, their sense had overcome Jeremy's scent, making the dogs unable to track him. At this point, investigators began to track more closely along the possibility of an abduction. In hopes of narrowing the field, they began close to home, questioning family and friends. Police reports note that multiple polygraphs were given to family members and everyone passed. A thorough check was done of the Arrington home, but according to Aiken County spokesman Troy Elwell, nothing was found, no evidence, not a trace of foul play. It seemed as though whatever had happened to Jeremy had occurred outside of the home, though investigators couldn't say for certain whether Jeremy had been lured outside or possibly led outside. At the time, a $2,500 reward was offered for any information leading to Jeremy or his abductor. Having investigated the family, police began talking about the likelihood that this had been a non-familial abduction. However, not everyone agreed. Jeremy's father, Ray, told reporters that he believed whoever had taken Jeremy had likely known him, saying, quote, I've claimed from the start it wasn't a total stranger. Somebody in that neighborhood got him. There's one road in there and one road out. There wouldn't be traffic in there on a rainy Friday morning, end quote. Many tended to agree with Ray, believing the chances that someone just happened to drive down that isolated road at just the right time that morning to abduct Jeremy was somewhat against the odds. However, investigators received a tip which lends some credence to the theory. Two employees of a gas station called The Depot in the town of Belvedere, approximately 10 miles to the northwest of Jeremy's home, contacted authorities with a bizarre sighting. According to official reports, on the morning of November 22nd, the day Jeremy went missing, both a clerk and manager at The Depot noted that a young boy had entered and paid for $10 worth of gas in addition to requesting to use the restroom. The employees remembered the boy because both noted how odd it was that a young child was walking around without shoes on during the cold, rainy weather. This sighting took place at approximately 10.30 a.m., 30 minutes after Donna noticed Jeremy was missing and just under two hours after Van Buren had seen him playing with the dog outside of his home. Both employees noted that the boy had been accompanied by an older white male driving a green four-door car. The description of the man himself is not noted. However, the official report explains that police had enough to have a composite image of the suspect drawn up. 
Interestingly, the report notes that during the process of running background checks on individuals living in the subdivision, they came across an older white male who had previously been charged with sexually assaulting a child. The report goes on to say, quote, One individual who had prior molestation charges and fit the description was checked thoroughly. End quote. There's no further information about this sighting or that potential suspect. I do think it's interesting to note, though, that shortly after this potential suspect is discussed, another search of the area was launched. This time it was conducted on foot and with the assistance of a plane which was brought in to fly over and scan the surrounding areas while photographing them. Despite their efforts, this new batch of searches once again yielded no results, and for police, it was completely frustrating. Time slowly began passing, and as it did, the amount of investigators assigned to the case began falling off. Police were stuck in a dead end. They had no major leads, no evidence, they didn't have a place to look. The final report granted to trace evidence by Aiken County is dated February 7th, 1986, three months after Jeremy disappeared. That report ends with the sentences, quote, Based on all data received, it appears to be a stranger abduction, motive unknown. All information received will be followed up on, and this case will remain open pending further investigation. End quote. Two months later, in April, multiple newspapers reported that the Aiken County Sheriff's Department had no options but to take a step back and return to the initial report of Jeremy's disappearance, as no major headway had been made. Hugh Munn, a spokesman for SLED, told the Index Journal, quote, The fact remains we have exhausted every lead. End quote. Sheriff Heath added after a press briefing, quote, we are at ground zero in this case. We've burned out all our leads and we're going back to square one. End quote. Heath also noted they hadn't discovered a single piece of evidence to suggest whether or not Jeremy might still be alive. Over the course of the next few years, police received multiple tips involving sightings of Jeremy, but when each of them was tracked down, it was never Jeremy Grice. In response to all of the sightings, Police employed what was then a special computer-generated age progress photo program showing what Jeremy might have looked like at age 6. These images were distributed amongst law enforcement as well as being broadcast by the media. Neither of Jeremy's parents would give up, and while Donna seemed to believe the police were doing all they could, Ray felt that they were doing too much waiting around. Sheriff Heath, in discussing this with the Greenville News, replied, quote, I'd be afraid to try and estimate the number of follow-up reports we've made. Even now, hardly a week goes by that we don't get leads. We follow them all because we haven't ruled out anything. End quote. I think it's interesting to note that in this same article, there's a comment from Jeremy's father, which taken on its own seems a bit strange. When asked about the possibility that Jeremy might be found, Ray replied, quote, I haven't given up on him, and when he's found, it'll surprise a lot of people who's involved. End quote. While this may have just been something Ray said off the cuff, it has led some to believe he may have more knowledge about what happened, or perhaps a suspicion about who may have been involved, though there's never been any follow-up to indicate one way or another. More age progress photographs of Jeremy were developed over the years, one being released on his 11th birthday in May of 1992. Subsequent searches have been conducted over the years, including one which took place in March of 1995, nearly 10 years after Jeremy disappeared. This search was helmed by Dennis Lundy, who owns a private investigation firm. The search area was Langley Pond, just five miles to the north of Jeremy's home. According to Lundy, this search was initiated after he received contact from an alleged psychic who claimed that Jeremy would be found in a pond and that there would also be a boat and a wheel in that pond. According to Lundy, while searches did not reveal Jeremy Grice, they did find the bow of a boat and the wheel to a tricycle. In April of 1999, William Ernest Downs was arrested and charged with sexual assault and murder of six-year-old Keenan O'Malia. According to court documents, on April 17th of that year, Keenan went riding his bike near Riverview Park in Augusta, South Carolina. 
Downs came upon Keenan and, according to his own confession, asked the six-year-old his name before savagely assaulting and murdering him. Riverview Park is located approximately 12 miles to the west of Jeremy Grice's home. After being arrested and questioned, Downs also confessed to a murder from eight years earlier. Ten-year-old James Porter was found dead in the Savannah River, which rides the border between Georgia and South Carolina. At the time, police ruled Porter's death an accidental drowning, as the six-year-old wasn't discovered for several months, and due to the condition of his remains, the medical examiner wasn't able to find anything to suggest a murder had taken place. However, this was disputed by Porter's family, who argued that the investigation had been done poorly, as it was later confessed by Downs that he had both sexually assaulted and murdered the young boy. He then subsequently dumped his body in the river. Considering the ages of the victims and the location, Downs was questioned about two specific missing child cases. Nine-year-old Tiffany Nelson, who vanished from Augusta, and of course, Jeremy Grice. At the time, Downs denied any involvement in either of those cases, and authorities believed that he likely would have confessed had he been responsible. Chief Weatherington of Augusta told reporter Greg Rickbaugh, quote, I would be surprised if there were more. He's been pretty upfront with us. If there were more, I don't know why he wouldn't have told us, end quote. At the time, Downs refused legal counsel, and he later, after pleading guilty, requested that he be given the death sentence, which he was granted. Eleven years after her disappearance, the remains of Tiffany Nelson were found in a wooded area approximately 15 miles from where she had last been seen. Her murder remains unsolved today. As for a possible connection to Jeremy, none has ever been established, but it has been noted Downs would have been 18 at the time, which would make Jeremy his first murder if indeed he was responsible. Unfortunately, there's no way to ask Downs as he was executed by lethal injection in July of 2006. During the research for this episode, I came across several pieces of information which have been troubling, but one possibly connects to Jeremy's father. In several places, I found mention that Jeremy's father had later been arrested, tried, and convicted of sexual assault against a minor. I have been able to find some information about a May 14, 2002 conviction of a William Ray Grice listed as living in Aiken, South Carolina. However, no official source makes a connection between Jeremy's father, Ray, and this William Ray Grice, though Ray Grice is listed as one of his aliases. Curiously, no article written about Jeremy following the year of 2002 draws any connections between his father and a sex offense, which seems like something you'd note in writing about the disappearance of a four-year-old. Official reports from the Aiken County Sheriff's Office list the father as Ray, not William Ray. However, ancestry documents tracking down the family, as well as an obituary of Jeremy's grandmother, do seem to establish that there is a William Ray Grice in that family tree. While I can neither confirm or deny this connection, I did think it was important to note. I should also add that I did reach out to several family members for comment on this issue, as well as this case in general, and while those messages were marked as read, no one responded. Jeremy James Grice has been missing since November 22, 1985. When last seen, Jeremy was described as a Caucasian male with blonde hair and hazel eyes standing 3 feet 8 inches tall and weighing approximately 40 pounds. Jeremy has moles on his scalp and behind his left earlobe and sometimes answers to the nickname Chris. When last seen, Jeremy was wearing blue jeans, a blue or purple shirt, and he was not wearing any socks or shoes. If alive today, Jeremy would be 39 years old and has been missing for 35 years. He was last seen in the area of North Augusta, South Carolina. A lot has changed in the 35 years since Jeremy disappeared. The street he lived on is completely different. The area where his mailbox once stood is gone. Where the home used to be is a large sign reading, Road Ends. However, for the investigators and for Jeremy's family, they are far from any ending. Until Jeremy is found, the search will continue, and while investigators have exhausted their leads, checked all angles, and searched countless times, they appear to be no closer to discovering the truth. At this time, 
Jeremy's case remains open but cold, and it's still classified as a non-familial abduction. There are some, though, who hold out hope that Jeremy may be alive out there somewhere, perhaps not even fully aware that he was abducted all those years ago. Thirty-five years ago, Jeremy Grice vanished from in front of his home and has never been seen again. The sheriff's office, FBI, SLED, and multiple law enforcement departments from the surrounding area conducted numerous searches on foot and by air, drained ponds, dove in others, and not a single trace of the four-year-old was ever found. A single tip suggested the possibility that Jeremy might have been taken in a green car by an unknown individual who bore a resemblance to someone living in his subdivision, but that road seems to dead end, like so much of this case. There are only a few different theories that have ever been discussed in this case, and in most of them the discussion has been short as the lack of evidence either for or against has been limited. This case doesn't receive a huge amount of attention, and so there aren't a lot of people out there developing theories, and even if there were, there's only so much to work with. This is truly one of those frustrating cases where almost everything is possible. However, there's a few different areas we can take a look at to get more of a general sense of what may or may not have happened. Initially, this case was treated as that of a missing child. It was believed that Jeremy may have wandered off somewhere that morning and ultimately found himself lost. The area from which he disappeared has some dense wooded areas not far away. There are several ponds in that area and some wildlife which could make easy work of a small four-year-old boy, let alone a full-grown adult. I suppose for many, the question is more about how a four-year-old would have gotten so lost that a miles-wide search conducted over the course of several days failed to find any trace. You're talking about a little boy without shoes who's not properly dressed for the weather. Had he managed to wander off in any particular direction, you'd think there'd be something left behind, Footprints, torn clothing, something. And yet, in this case, investigators never found a thing. That doesn't mean it's impossible that he was out there, just that he could have been missed. While you have a large amount of people participating in these searches, you also have them looking for someone who's very small. It's happened before. People get missed and then later found in areas that have been searched multiple times. If you look at the official timeline, Jeremy's last seen at approximately 8.45 a.m. The search begins close to 2 p.m., so ultimately Jeremy had four to five hours of a head start. How far a small, shoeless child can get in that time might be surprising, as I've certainly seen cases where missing children were found miles away in shorter windows of time through much harsher terrain. However, it doesn't seem very likely. If Jeremy did wander into the wilderness, there's a large number of dangers he could have faced. It was cold and rainy, the ground was slick, he wasn't wearing shoes. He could have slipped in any number of places, fallen into a hole or a shaft that would go mostly unnoticed to anyone searching the area. It's not difficult to imagine he could have become severely injured in a situation where he wouldn't have been able to make it out, or he could have taken a dangerous fall that killed him and subsequently buried him, leaving none the wiser. There are several animals in the area which certainly could have been involved in attacking Jeremy. Aside from bears, which were likely in hibernation at the time, there were also wolves and alligators. While the number of alligators in the area isn't considered extremely high, there have been multiple reports of them being in the Savannah River, let alone in swampy areas. There were multiple ponds in that area, which may have been home to an alligator or two at the time. Sadly, were Jeremy to have come into contact with an animal, I don't think his chances of survival were very likely. It does seem strange with the dog, though, that he was found later and apparently didn't show any signs of having experienced any kind of attack or dangerous situation. Then again, we have no way of knowing if the dog stayed with Jeremy or ran off on its own at some point. Hell, the dog could have run off prompting Jeremy to pursue it in the first place. Ultimately, after all the searches, police concluded that it was highly unlikely that Jeremy had disappeared into the surrounding area. To this day, when searches are conducted and nothing's been found, authorities have determined that it's likely the child was the victim of an abduction. If that was the case, there's a few different scenarios that have been presented. The first one is that of a stranger abduction. 
We know that Jeremy wasn't exactly shy and he did speak to strangers. His mother told several papers that she had discussions with him about the dangers of talking to strangers, but were also dealing with a four-year-old who seemed very open to new interactions. He loved going for rides in cars, and it isn't all that difficult to imagine someone could have driven up and offered him a ride or a treat, and he may have gone along with them. I do tend to agree with Jeremy's father that it's odd someone would be looking to abduct a child in that subdivision with cold weather and rain on the off chance that they might find an unsupervised child outside. Certainly it's possible, but it feels like it would be much more likely if we were looking for someone closer to a main road with pass-throughs, not a one-way-in, one-way-out mobile home park. Jeremy's parents are convinced he was likely taken by someone he knew in some way, But stranger things have happened, and we can't completely rule out a stranger abduction. We do have the information about William Ernest Downs. While convicted of only two murders, Downs tended to hunt his victims in the area surrounding Jeremy's home. Both of the murders occurred less than 15 miles from where Jeremy was last seen. Downs targeted young boys, assaulted, and murdered them. One he left lying where he killed him. Another he tossed into the Savannah River. However, the first of those murders took place in 1991, when Downs would have been 24 years old. According to him, he'd only been responsible for those two crimes, and investigators believe that it was true. He didn't try to argue against them, he just confessed and requested the death sentence, so why would he lie about it? Well, that's what these sick people do. How many killers have claimed murders they didn't commit while denying ones they did? It's not like you're dealing with someone who has any particular interest in honesty. Maybe he'd reached a point in life where he wanted to die, and he figured the confessions would get it done. Maybe he wasn't involved, and maybe he was lying like almost all of them do. We have no way of knowing, and where Downs is right now, he couldn't hear us if we did ask. That being said, a lot of it fits. Jeremy would have fit into the age range that Downs hunted for. I find it incredibly hard to believe he didn't commit his first murder until the age of 24, and following that, waited eight years before he struck again. This was a man who lived much of his life in Georgia, and yet would cross into South Carolina to commit these atrocious crimes. At the time Jeremy disappeared, Downs would have been 18 years old. I saw a lot of newspapers being somewhat dismissive of a possible connection, saying that Downs would only have been a teenager at the time but 18 is certainly old enough to have begun committing such heinous acts. For some killers, that's a late start. Unfortunately, there's no evidence to make the connection. The world is a strange place and bizarre things can line up. I just find it really hard to swallow that Jeremy disappears and then Downs commits only two murders of young children over eight years and that's the extent of his crimes. It doesn't make sense to me, and it likely doesn't make sense to investigators, but without more information, there's really nothing to tie Downs to Jeremy Grice. Investigators struggled to establish a timeline for Downs, and for the most part, there's a lot of gaps involved in where he was during a lot of his life. However, something kept drawing him back to that area. I don't think we can fully rule out that he might have been in that area hunting in 1985. Outside of Downs, We have two witnesses who see Jeremy in the presence of an older white male who fits the description of a child predator who lives in the subdivision Jeremy disappeared from. To me, this is almost too on the nose to look past. It puts him in the area. He lived there. And much like Van Buren, maybe he'd seen Jeremy around the neighborhood before. There's very few reasons to imagine someone looking to abduct a child would be hanging out on that dead-end road unless he was familiar with it and knew there was someone there to target. Jeremy used to get picked up by the bus in front of his house. I'm sure this neighbor would have seen him out there from time to time, and while his mother put him on the bus the day before he vanished, I can't help but wonder if there weren't mornings where he waited on his own. It probably wouldn't have been complicated. A lot of articles suggested that Jeremy may have been outside waiting for the bus, unaware there was no school that day. Maybe this guy drives over and offers to give him a ride. The no shoes and jacket thing is strange, but it's also a four-year-old boy, so I'm not sure exactly what his thought process would have been. His mother was asleep. His stepfather left at 7. He's outside at 8.45. Sometime between 8.45 and 10, Jeremy gets taken. Is it so difficult to imagine it could have been someone living in the area, especially someone with a history of sexually assaulting children? 
Ultimately, there's very little written about this potential suspect other than that he was checked thoroughly. I don't exactly know what that means, but it doesn't scream to me that he was ruled out. In fact, in those police reports, they make a clear distinction that two vans were searched, checked, and cleared. This man doesn't say he was cleared, just that he was checked thoroughly. Again, we don't have a lot to work with here, but this is a scenario which seems believable. Unfortunately, I don't have the information I'd like. What did he drive? When did he get home? Where did he say he was that day? All I know is I'm likely keeping a close eye on that guy in the future to see if he tries anything with any other children if I'm an investigator. I'd really love to know if Jeremy knew this guy in any way and therefore wouldn't have considered him a stranger. So you've got Downs and you've got this neighbor. You've got the possibility of a complete stranger that no one's looked at, though the scenario would likely be similar to one involving either of these two men and discussing it would just be speculative at this point. Could a stranger have been there that day and abducted Jeremy? Certainly. Does that seem completely likely? Well, I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. So, outside of a stranger or a neighbor or a convicted killer, you're really left with friends and family. People Jeremy would have known, people Jeremy would have trusted. According to official reports, multiple members of Jeremy's family underwent polygraph examinations and passed. Police questioned them thoroughly, timelines were established, and alibis were investigated. There's nothing in the files to suggest any suspicion on the family, but that doesn't mean there isn't a possibility. The fact of the matter is, the last time Donna saw her son was putting him on the bus the day before he vanished. Nick later feeds him, puts him to bed, and says he's awake and playing in the house at 7 a.m. the day he vanishes. Police search the home and surrounding areas. They question Nick and Donna, in addition to all neighbors, multiple times, and were never able to establish that any crime had been committed in the home itself. You've got a little boy who's afraid of water, is afraid of the rain, and somehow he ends up outside in the cold rain with no shoes, and he leaves behind his beloved jacket that it's a struggle to ever get him to go anywhere without. It just doesn't make any sense. There doesn't appear to be anything to suggest that either Donna or Nick were involved. Donna's been very devoted to trying to find her son for 35 years, and in every interview I've read with her, it seems apparent that she's devastated by the loss. In even her most recent interviews, Donna still refers to Jeremy in the present tense. She does consider the possibility that he could still be out there somewhere. I didn't find a ton of information about Jeremy's biological father, Ray. Outside of having been directly involved in the searches and making some statements questioning investigators' methods, he has, for the most part, been in the background. I know I discussed the potential link to a sex crime in the years after Jeremy's disappearance, but again, I reiterate that I couldn't conclusively make that connection. That being said, I did find Ray's comments bizarre, the one where he mentioned that people will be surprised when they find out who was responsible. Was this just a father going off about it, or is it possible he has his own suspicions, or maybe even knows? That's an impossible question to answer. Out of all the information I could find, I couldn't locate anywhere where Ray made any direct statements accusing anyone or suggesting a possible suspect. I've seen some discussion online of people who have thought Ray himself could be considered a person of interest. I haven't found anything to note that police ever considered him a suspect, but I also didn't find anything directly arguing against that other than their listing this as a non-familial abduction. To me, that indicates that either they cleared all family members or they don't have enough information to officially say anything about a relative's possible involvement. It's a complicated case complicated even further by the lack of evidence and information. A family member, a neighbor, a convicted killer, or a complete and total stranger. This case truly runs the gamut of possibilities, and we have no real way to discuss or fully entertain any of them. In a case like this where you have almost nothing to work with, it's difficult to rule anyone in or out. That being said, there are some who believe there's a possibility that Jeremy is still out there somewhere. Four years old is extremely young. If he'd been abducted by someone who chose to raise him as their own, or perhaps gave him to someone else to do so, would he remember what happened to him? Maybe, but maybe not. We've seen cases where people discover years later that they've been the victims of an abduction. 
It doesn't happen all that often, but there are certainly instances where it has. While I admit the chance seems small, there is still a chance. There's a possibility that there's a 39-year-old man living his life out there somewhere with no knowledge that he is Jeremy James Grice. While a terrible situation, it would certainly be a much happier ending to find that out, to find him alive, as opposed to the alternative. 35 years is a long time to seek the truth, but we've seen cases solved that were far older. Maybe Jeremy's case still has a chance. Maybe Jeremy himself might discover that truth. Sadly, though, the road comes to a dead end for now. Jeremy's case is like several others I've done. Little information, severely limited evidence, lack of a crime scene, and just a whole list of questions without answers. In my communication with the Aiken County Sheriff's Office, they made it clear that the case is still open and they couldn't share all of their files as they didn't want to risk the integrity of their case. My sincere hope is that there's further information in those files that points in a particular direction and that maybe, someday, they may find what they need to bring Jeremy home. Unfortunately, without new evidence, a confession, or finding Jeremy himself, the disappearance of Jeremy James Grice will remain open, unsolved, and very cold. If you're looking for more information about the disappearance of Jeremy James Grice, there are some news articles and websites discussing his case, but not a great deal of information is available. In the future, I'll scan in the files that I received and make them available on the website. You can look up Jeremy's case on NICMEC under number 601591. Jeremy is also in NCIC case number M513626844. He is also listed on NamUs under MP6141. If you have any information about the disappearance of Jeremy James Grice, please contact the Aiken County Sheriff's Office at 803-502-1860. You can also contact the FBI's Aiken Field Office at 803-648-0728. I want to give a special thank you to the Aiken County Sheriff's Office for providing me with some documents related to this case. Without those documents, I would have been completely unable to do this episode, so I thoroughly appreciate the chance to try and spread the word about Jeremy's disappearance. What do you believe happened? Tweet me at TraceEvPod, email me at TraceEvidencePod at gmail.com, Message me on Instagram at Trace Evidence Pod or comment in the Facebook group. I'd like to take a moment now to thank our amazing Patreon producers Alicia Lorraine, Anne M. Bertram, Astrid Maria Nair, Brett Eady, Brittany Bivens, Brian Kemmerling, Christine Greco, Krista Colvin, Diane Dyson, Eamon Brady, Emily Smith, Emma Vachon, Jessica Chagnon, Kevin Bonham, Megan Cotter, Michael Draves, Nick Mohar Schurz, Pamela Coburn, Quinn McBreen, Roberta Jansen, Sarah, Samantha Ford, Stephanie Eve, Stephen Wyland, Tara Doble, Tom Archer, Tracy Woods, and Travis Skepsko. You're all amazing and your contributions are greatly appreciated, as are all patrons. If you're interested in supporting Trace Evidence, please visit patreon.com slash trace evidence or visit trace-evidence.com for further information. I want to thank you all for taking the time to listen, and I hope you'll join me next week for another unsolved case on the next episode of Trace Evidence.